Hello, my name is Sarah Dean, and this is video three in a tutorial series on using IGV. In the previous video, I went over some of the file types used for variant viewing and interpretation in IGV, and how to load and display them in IGV. In this video, we'll go over basic IGV functions that are useful for viewing and interpreting variants. All right, so let's go over the basic layout. I already have some data loaded into IGV. I cover how to load the data in video two, previous video. Here is the name of the reference genome I'm using. I cover how to download the reference genome in video one. Here is a list of chromosomes. I'm currently on chromosome nine. And in this window, I can either enter a gene that I'd like to go to or specific genomic positions. So I've already entered genomic positions that I'd like to view here. Along the left side of the screen, you can see the names of different tracks, and these represent the different data files that I have loaded into IGB. In video two, I describe each of these different data files in detail, so I'm not going to describe them here. The reference genome is listed down at the bottom here, and I'm currently zoomed in enough that I can see the translation or the list of amino acids for this part of the reference genome. If I zoom out, I wouldn't be able to see that. So here it just shows the directionality of the strand. By default, the forward or plus strand, positive strand of each chromosome is displayed with the five prime end on the left and the three prime end on the right. The designation for forward or positive strand is not related to genes. It's just the strand whose five prime end is at the tip of the short arm of the chromosome. Introns are indicated by thin lines. Exons are indicated by thick lines. I'm going to zoom in again so you can see each individual nucleotide in this gene. You can see that they're color-coded, and this just makes it easier when you are panned out to see what the sequence is without actually having to read it. You can quickly identify homopolymer regions, for example. So I mentioned that the reference genome, when you're zoomed in, shows you the translation or the amino acid sequence of the gene. You can see here in gray there are alternative transcripts and this can help you identify the consequence of a frame shift mutation. So each of these is framing codons differently. Left clicking on the nucleic acid sequence will show or hide the frame shift translations for the forward strand. Now, sometimes none of the amino acid translations for the three frames in gray here will match the translation of the reference genome in this bottom track. And this is because the reference is the actual translation of the gene, which might actually be encoded on the minus strand or the reverse strand. So in that case, to get them to match, you would want to right-click on the reference DNA sequence and select flip. This will give you the reverse complement of the sequence, which is the minus or reverse strand. So now one of the three translation frames would match the reference. Because in this particular part of the genome, the reference is the positive strand, now I have created that mismatch by flipping. But if we go to another part of the genome, you can see what I'm talking about. So here's an example of a gene that is encoded on the reverse strand. You can tell because these little arrows indicate that the gene is running from right to left instead of left to right. If I zoom in here, you'll see that none of the translations in gray, none of the codon frames in gray, match the codons of the reference genome. And again, that's because these tracks are running left to right while the reference genome is running right to left. So again, now you can see that if I flip the strand, now we find that the center track matches the reference genome. All right, so let's go back to where we were before. I'm just gonna paste the genomic positions I want to go to into this window up here. All right, so now we're back at this jack two. If you left click on the reference genome, you get information about the amino acid that you just clicked on. So what is the amino acid number, for example, the exon that, you're, that you clicked on, the chromosome that you clicked on, as well as the transcript information. So this exon number is different for different transcripts. The amino acid number is different for different transcripts. And there are even links for finding more about this transcript in NCBI. As I scroll over the nucleotides, you can notice this window in the bottom left, uh, the numbers change, and that's because it's telling me exactly what the genomic position is for each nucleotide that I hover over. This track just above the DNA alignment is a histogram. If I scroll out, you can see how it changes over the gen different genomic positions. 
This is an indicator of the depth of coverage for each separate genomic position. So you have a bar in the histogram for each nucleotide. So these positions on the left are well covered and much better covered than these positions over here on the right side of the screen. Left clicking on one of these bars tells you the exact depth of coverage as well as what the what nucleotide was called at this position. Now, if there is a variant there, or potentially a variant, or even a sequencing artifact, you'll have different nucleotides called in different sequences. So this little window shows you how frequently each of these nucleotides was called at this position, and which strand they were called in. So right now, all the DNA in the alignment is gray, except where a nucleotide differs from the reference genome. And this makes it easier to see variants so that you can assess them. So it's obvious right here that this seed is not expected. It's possible to change the color coding, which you may want to do if you'd like to see the entire sequence or if you'd like to bring out different features of the alignment. So if I'd like to see the entire DNA sequence, I can simply right click here and select show all bases. Okay, now this makes it a lot harder to see variants, which is why I have hidden all bases so that I can just see the putative mutations. So when I right-click on the alignment, you can see that there are many different options for sorting or coloring the alignment that bring out different features that I might be interested in. So for example, I could go to sort alignments by and sort by base. Because I have the alignment centered on this T, now all the T's are brought to the top of the alignment and all the G's, which are not shown because they match the reference genome, lie below. I can also shade bases by quality score. And this just means that uh, when that is selected, bases that are of higher quality will be darker than those with lower quality. So this T here is fainter than the T's above it. And that means that its quality score is lower. So if you were to have a variant composed entirely of very faintly colored nucleotides, that might suggest that you're not very confident in that variant being real. When you sort by base, you have to make sure that the base that you're sorting by is centered in the window. It can make it a lot easier to tell if the base you're interested in is centered if you produce a center line. So to do that, you would go to View and Preferences. And here you can find a number of alignment preferences. So I can just scroll down here to find the option to show the center line here and select that and then click Save. Now my center line is produced and I can see whether the bases I'm attempting to sort by are centered or not. You can sort by indels as well. So let's go to a part of the alignment with an indel. Uh, there's an insertion and a deletion here. So I'm gonna zoom in. So I could sort by base. And by doing this, now I have, there's A's at the top here, but they're very faint, meaning confidence in these calls is very poor. These are followed by C's that were found at this position, followed by deletions. So the gap here indicates a deletion, meaning the T that's expected is missing, followed by insertions. So these are insertions indicating there's more bases here between this C and T than expected. And I can left click on them to see what was inserted. So in this case, it's a single nucleotide insertion. This says two, meaning there's a two, there's two nucleotides inserted. All right, followed by the expected T. So a lot of unexpected calls were made at this particular position. There are many different sorting options. You can sort by quality scores, such as mapping quality. You can reverse sort, um, and you know you could just read through these and experiment with them. But that's where the sorting options are. You can also group alignments. This is similar to sorting the alignments, except you're creating different sections for the different calls. So for example, I could group alignments by base at this position. And now you can see that a dotted line now divides the different sections here. But this has removed organization by insertion because the insertion isn't exactly at this spot. The insertion happens between this position and the position before it. I can undo the groupings simply by going to group alignments by none. So now we're back to normal. There are other color coding options. So I can just right click on the alignment and go to color alignments by, and you can see that my alignment automatically is colored by insert size and pair orientation. 
I'm going to wait until video five, where we cover structural variants, to explain this color coding option. This color coding option is really much more useful for understanding and identifying structural variants. For looking at SNPs and small indels, it's much more useful to color alignments by read strand. So now all of the forward strands are pink and all of the reverse strands are blue. Now we already talked about shading bases by quality, but I can also shade the alignments by quality scores. So here just, you know, underneath color alignment options, there are shade alignment options. So here you have mapping quality high and mapping, mapping quality low. So in just like with the bases, if I do mapping quality high, the entire strand will be shaded by how well uh, it maps to the reference genome. So darker is a higher mapping quality score. The alternative option just reverses that shading scheme. For now, I just want to see these all shaded the same way, so I'm going to go back to none. You can see the features of each sequence by left-clicking on that sequence. This gives you information about the length of that particular amplicon, quality scores, genomic positions, and whether this particular sequence was mapped to the positive strand or the negative strand. Another useful option is to view as pairs. I'm gonna zoom out to look at this option. So if I right click again, I can view as pairs. Now our sequencing chemistry is paired and sequencing, which means that every amplicon is sequenced first in the forward direction and then in the reverse direction, resulting in two reads, a forward read and a reverse read. So this view shows each forward read with its mate, with its reverse read. The effect of anchored multiplex PCR is more obvious when you pair reads in this way. And actually, I can make the effect of anchored multiplex PCR in this alignment even more obvious by sorting the alignments by first pair of strand, in which case the position of the first pair is what is used as the organizing feature. So we have all the universal primers now at the top with their unpredictable binding sites and the gene-specific primers are all listed down here. You may also notice that some of these reads happen to not have a mate. Now, if anything in your alignment doesn't look like mine, but you would like it to, you can go back to view, preferences, and find pretty much anything you want to change about your alignment view here in this alignment tab. If you are looking for rare variants and having trouble viewing them, you may want to unclick downsample reads. Uh, downsampling is something that the software does so that it has an easier time more quickly opening alignments. Downsampling is taking a random subsample from the full data set. So proportionally, all the sequences should be the same as in the full data set because it's a random sample. But if you're looking for rare variants, they might be excluded by downsampling. So if you really want to make sure that you're not missing anything, you can un unclick this. Uh, that can cause IGV to work slower because it's displaying more data, but it will also help make sure that you're seeing all of the data that you're looking for. All right, this concludes video three of this tutorial series. In the next video, we'll look at some more examples of SNPs and indels, as well as a few sequencing artifacts, and we'll discuss in more detail how to tell the difference between the two.